He was an iconic singer and film actor. He was charismatic and talented, and literally shocked the world of music with a new sound. Thousands of American teenagers dreamed about his hairstyle, and other thousands envied his popularity among girls. Today, we will talk about the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, who, thanks to his desire and personal ambitions, got out of poverty and became a legend. How did he achieve such overwhelming success? Why did they want to put him in jail? And why didn't Elvis live a long life? You are on the Enco Stories channel. Sit back and let's get started. Elvis Aaron Presley was born on January 8, 1935 in Tupelo, Mississippi. His parents, Vernon Elvis and Gladys Love Presley, lived in a shotgun house that Vernon built for the birth of the child. Elvis wasn't the family's only expected child. His twin brother, Jesse Garen Presley, who was born half an hour before Elvis, was stillborn. His father was of German, Scottish, and English descent, and his mother, Gladys, was of Scottish-Irish with French-Norman ancestry. There were working-class families and native Cherokees in the clan. Elvis's granddaughter, Riley Keough, confirms that her great-great-grandmother, Gladys, was Cherokee. I had one great-grandma who was Creek and one who was full-blood Cherokee. Gladys was the head of the small Presley family. Elvis grew close to his parents from childhood and over time formed a particularly close bond with his mother. Family that consisted of grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins lived next to each other in Tupelo. The family did not live richly. Vernon changed one odd job for another, not particularly showing his ambitions. The family often had to rely on government food aid or help from neighbors, but the parents struggled to provide everything for their son, who was the meaning of their lives. They lost their home when Elvis was three years old in May 1938. Vernon was found guilty of forging a check issued to him by a landowner and occasional employer. He was sentenced to three years in the Mississippi State Penitentiary at Parkman and Gladys and Elvis moved in with relatives. Vernon spent eight months behind bars, after which he was released on the condition that he would maintain good behavior. Elvis entered the first grade at East Tupelo Consolidated School in September 1941. The teachers considered him average. By 1943, from the age of eight, Elvis was spending many Saturday nights at the Tupelo Courthouse, from where Wello broadcast Saturday Jamboree. It was an amateur program that had a live audience. It numbered up to 150 people. Anyone could sing or play on the program, and Elvis did it repeatedly. Old Shep was just one of the many songs he sang. At the end of the Second World War, where the boy's father helped build a POW camp, Vernon bought a new four-room house on Berry Street, East Tupelo. Elvis entered the fifth grade during that period. At the beginning of the school term, his teacher, Mrs. Grimes, asked her students if any of them wanted to say a prayer. Elvis stood up and said one, then immediately began to sing Old Shep. Mrs. Grimes was very impressed. He sang it so sweetly, she once said. The teacher took him to the headmaster, Mr. Cole. Elvis sang Old Shep again. Mr. Cole was no less impressed. That was a few weeks before the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show in Tupelo. Elvis was immediately selected to participate. Elvis sang for the public on October 3, 1945 on Children's Day at the annual Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show in the Central Square. That was his first public performance. Ten-year-old Elvis stood on the chair by a microphone and sang Old Shep at a youth talent show on Wello Radio. It is said that Elvis took second place by putting on his glasses and standing on a chair to reach the microphone in front of several hundred people. He wore glasses for a short time in fifth grade. Elvis was supposed to receive free tickets to all the attractions of the fair and $5 for second place. However, according to his flashbacks, he took fifth place and on the same day, instead of a prize, he received a spanking from his mother for participating in one of the most dangerous attractions. Gladys bought her son his first guitar at the Tupelo Hardware Store for $7.90 for Elvis's 11th birthday on January 8th next year. According to the owner of the store, F.L. Bobo, Elvis wanted either a rifle or a bicycle. But his mother only had the money for a guitar, so she persuaded Elvis to buy it. He received basic guitar lessons from two of his uncles and a new pastor at the family church over the next year. Presley recalled, I took the guitar and I watched people and I learned to play a little bit. But I would never sing in public. I was very shy about it. Just 11 months after buying the house on Berry Street, the family sold it and moved to Tupelo in a small alley next to the fairgrounds, right across from the black quarter of the city Shake Rag. Elvis went to 6th grade at Milam Junior High School. 
He was invited to sing the song at the request of teacher Mrs. Camp. She recalled, He was so good the children just got quiet and pleased with him. He began bringing his guitar to school daily the following year. He played and sang at lunchtime and was often teased by his classmates as a cheesy kid playing hillbilly music. Presley was a fan of the Mississippi Slim show on the Tupelo Wella radio station. Mississippi Slim was his first musical hero. Slim's younger brother, who was one of Presley's classmates and often took him to the radio station, described Elvis as crazy about music. Slim told Presley even more new things about playing the guitar, demonstrating the technique of playing chords. He was allowed to sing twice live on the station, hosted by Mississippi Slim when Elvis turned 12. However, for the first time, the boy had serious stage fright and was unable to appear in the scheduled performance. Nevertheless, he appeared on the air and performed the song with the support of the musician a week later. At the age of 13 in November 1948, he and his family moved to Memphis, Tennessee, 80 miles northwest of Tupelo and lived in downtown boarding houses for much of the next year. Thus, the family changed about 10 dwellings. Elvis continued his 8th grade studies at Humes High School in Memphis. Elvis's musical horizons were expanded during that period. He had many opportunities to get close to music due to the radio, the church, music stores, and nightclubs. In addition, Elvis played in a band with four other boys from Lauderdale Courts. Elvis began to pay special attention to his appearance during that period. He let his hair and sideburns grow longer than usual and began to wear extremely colorful clothes that made him stand out, especially against the background of the conservative, conformist Deep South of the 50s. Elvis wore trousers every day at a time when everyone at school wore jeans. He wore a coat and tied a scarf like an ascot tie, like some kind of film star. People looked at him with surprise, but the guy already knew what he wanted to strive for. You ain't nothing but The life of the Presley family at that time had not yet improved. Vernon and Gladys were changing jobs one by one. Elvis moonlighted to feed himself and his parents. Together, they went to the Assembly of God Church. Elvis continued to sing along with the guitar, when shopping on Beale Street, and actively absorbed the black blues and gospel music that sounded around him. At night, he regularly attended white and black gospel performances in the city center. Interestingly, Elvis managed to get married when he was 13 years old. As an impulsive teenager, he was so in love with Magdalene Morgan that he secretly forged his parents' marriage certificate by inscribing himself and Magdalena on it. They met at the First Assembly of God Church. Elvis set September 11th as the date of marriage, which would surprise Magdalene 50 years later when she found out about it. Elvis loved comics, especially Captain Marvel Jr. His cousin Harold Lloyd recalled that in high school in Memphis, they exchanged comics. Sometimes I would borrow some from him. He would let me have them because he knew I would return them in good shape. His schoolwork took a back seat as Elvis's passion for music became overwhelming in 1952. The range of A, B, and C grades during his freshman year at Humes degenerated so much that he became a C student. When his music teacher told him he couldn't sing, he brought his guitar the next day and sang the recent Keep Them Cold, Icy Fingers Off Me to prove the opposite. Most of his free time, Elvis spent in cinemas and music stores. At night, together with his parents, he attended gospel singing sessions at Ellis Auditorium, where he noticed interesting stage movements from the most charismatic performers. Gospel singing contained the spirituality and physicality that became the basis of the musical style of the young Elvis Presley. However, when he sang and played the guitar at parties, he was much more likely to perform Dean Martin, Bing Crosby, or Perry Como pop music. Elvis signed up for military service in January 1953. Then, according to the conscription system, young people in good health had to be free from the age of 18 for two years of military service. Elvis entered the Hume's annual minstrel show a couple months before graduating from high school on April 9, 1953. He performed the song Till I Waltz Again With You by Teresa Brewer. Elvis really shocked students, parents, and teachers by singing and playing the guitar in his performance. He later recalled, I wasn't popular in school. I failed in music. Only thing I ever failed. And then they entered me in this talent show. When I came on stage, I heard people kind of rumbling and whispering and so forth because nobody knew I even sang. It was amazing how popular I became in school after that. That performance greatly contributed to the reputation of the future singer. 
Presley, who had received no formal musical training and could not read music, learned and played by ear. During that period, he frequented music stores, which had jukeboxes and listening booths. By the last year of school, Elvis knew all the songs of Hank Snow and adored the records of other country artists such as Roy Acuff, Ernest Tubb, Ted Defon, Jimmy Rogers, Jimmy Davis, and Bob Wills. One of Elvis's favorite performers, Southern gospel singer Jake Hess, significantly influenced his style of singing ballads. He was a regular participant on the monthly all-night singings downtown. Whenever possible, he attended blues concerts in the segregated South, only on evenings reserved exclusively for white audiences. And of course, he listened to regional radio stations like WDIA AM that played racing records, spirituals, blues, and the modern backbeat heavy sound of rhythm and blues. Local African-American musicians, such as Arthur Crudup and Rufus Thomas, inspired some of Presley's future work. Graduating from school was the starting point in the high world of music for Elvis, where he had long dreamed and hoped to get. Elvis got a job at the M.B. Parker Machinist's Garage for $33 a week after graduating from Hume's High School on June 3, 1953, which can hardly be considered an attribute of a future legend. But soon, everything fell into place. Presley registered at the office of Sun Records in August 1953. He wanted to pay for a few minutes of studio time to record a double-sided record, My Happiness and That's When Your Heartaches Begin. He later claimed that he wanted to give the record to his mother for her birthday, even though a nearby general store had a much cheaper amateur recording service. He probably chose Sun Records, hoping to get noticed. The studio administrator, producer Marion Kiesker, repeatedly asked the guy which of the performers he looked like, to which Elvis replied, I sing all kinds. I don't sound like nobody. Marion remembered Elvis at their first meeting as shy, a little woebegone, cradling his battered, beat-up child's guitar. The boss of the studio, Sam Phillips, called Marion after the recording was completed with a request to write down the name of that guy, to which she herself replied, Good ballad singer, hold. During the recording, Elvis asked Marion Kiesker if she knew any bands that were looking for a singer, but the answer was disappointing. During the first months of his musical development, he knew that he wanted to become a singer, but did not know how exactly to do it. So he just hung around Memphis Recording Service Studios for a few months. It wasn't until January 1954 that Presley recorded his second personal album, I'll Never Stand in Your Way, and It Wouldn't Be the Same Without You. But that didn't help him become a professional artist. Elvis failed an audition for the local vocal quartet Songfellows after being told he couldn't sing. Elvis changed work to instructions from his former boss to cut his hair in April. He got a job as a truck driver at Crown Electric for a good salary of $40 a week. His friend Ronnie Smith, who was also a music enthusiast with whom they played several shows, was already in a real professional band at the age of 16. That group was led by Eddie Bond, who had been playing in Memphis for several years and was now in need of a vocalist. Ronnie suggested Elvis for the position, but after a couple of songs Presley failed, Bond rejected him, advising to keep driving the truck. He said that he would, quote, never be a singer. Fate literally gave the guy a second chance at that time. He found out that Sun Records boss Sam Phillips was looking for a new, amazing sound. He needed a performer who could bring to a wider audience the sound of black musicians who were very popular. Sam bought a demo of Jimmy Sweeney's ballad, Without You, believing that it would suit a teenage singer, so he invited Elvis to the studio. Phillips did not like his performance, but he asked Presley to sing as many songs as he knew. He was so impressed with what he heard that he invited two local musicians, guitarist Winfield Scotty Moore and double bassist Bill Black, to compose and record something with Elvis. The musical session that took place on the evening of July 5th until late at night was completely unsuccessful. Presley picked up his guitar and played Arthur Crudup's 1946 blues number That's All Right when everyone was about to stop trying and go home. Moore recalled that, All of a sudden, Elvis just started singing this song, jumping around and acting the fool. And then Bill picked up his bass and he started acting the fool too and I started playing with them. Sam, I think, had the door to the control booth open. He stuck his head out and said, what are you doing? And we said, we don't know. Well, back up, he said. Try to find a place to start and do it again. Phillips immediately started recording because that was the sound 
he was looking for. Popular Memphis DJ Dewey Phillips played That's All Right on his red, hot, and blue show three days later. The listeners began to call, wanting to know who was that singer. There was such interest that Dewey Phillips played the record on repeat for the remaining two hours of his performance. He interviewed Pressy live and asked him what high school he went to clarify his color to many callers. Many of them assumed he was black. Over the next few days, the trio with Elvis recorded Bill Monroe's Blue Moon of Kentucky in a bluegrass style, again in a distinctive style, using an artificial echo effect that Sam Phillips called slapback. Thus was released a single with That's All Right and Blue Moon of Kentucky. And he would record the music to this machine, it's mono, so everything would go live. He might have four microphones, but it would all go to one track tape, so there's no changing anything later. Eddie Bond asked Ronnie Smith to find out if Elvis wanted to sing with him now after the record became a hit in Memphis. Elvis politely declined the invitation. Presley Moore in Black performed in public for the first time at the Bon Air Club on July 17th. Elvis still performed with his first guitar. The trio played at the Overton Park Shell at the end of the month. That performance became special because of Elvis's eccentric dance. He performed Rubber Legs for the first time, but soon it would be his most recognizable signature movement. The combination of high from the beat and nervousness playing in front of a large crowd had Presley shaking his legs during the performance. His wide pants accentuated those movements, causing the girls in the audience to scream. During the instrumental parts, he would back off from the mic and be playing and shaking and the crowd would just go wild. Black, being a born showman, screamed as he played his bass, delivering double strikes that Presley later recalled as a really wild sound, like a drum in the jungle or something. Soon after, Moore and Black left their old band, the Starlight Wranglers, to play regularly with Elvis, and DJ promoter Bob Neal became the trio's manager. They often played Eagle's Nest from August to October and returned to the Sun Studio to record new material. Presley quickly became more confident on stage. According to Moore, his movement was a natural thing, but he was also very conscious of what got a reaction. He'd do something one time and then he would expand on it real quick. Elvis appeared in the Louisiana Hayride in November 1954. It was the main and freer revival of the Grand Old Opry, where the musician appeared only once in October and was notified that he was not suitable for that program. At the same time, the Shreveport show aired on 198 radio stations in 28 states. Elvis again had a nervous attack, and although at first the listeners reacted with restraint, the more energetic second set caused an enthusiastic response from the audience. Shortly after the show, Hayride hired Presley for a full year of performances on Saturday nights. After trading his old guitar for $8 and seeing it immediately go to the rubbish, Elvis purchased a Martin guitar for a hefty $175. That's $1,800 in 2023. Elvis's new contract with Bob Neal went into effect on January 1st, 1955, and over the next few months, a smiling photo of Elvis, Neal, and Sam Phillips commemorating the event appeared in various periodicals and fanzines. And the trio went to play in new places, including New Orleans, Louisiana, Houston, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. Elvis, along with many up-and-coming artists like Minnie Pearl, Johnny Horton, and Johnny Cash, sang the praises of Louisiana Hayride sponsor, Donut Maker Southern Made Donuts. Presley had a lifelong love of donuts, receiving a box of them with hot icing in exchange for a radio promo tape. Unfortunately, that Elvis commercial was never released. Soon, Presley made his first television appearance on KSLA-TV's Louisiana Hayride. In his regular Hayride appearances, constant touring and well-received record releases made him a regional star from Tennessee to West Texas. That brought to him the attention of Colonel Tom Parker, whom Bob Neal considered the best promoter in the music business. Parker invited Presley to perform at Hank Snow's February Country Tour. Elvis's fourth singles, Baby Let's Play House and I'm Left, You're Right, She's Gone, were released on April 10th. Well, you may go to college, you may go to school. That release was considered especially successful for a young artist. In May, Presley toured the South Daily, which led to Colonel Parker writing to Bob Neal at the end of the month that he wanted to participate in promoting Elvis's career. Elvis went to Texarkana on June 5th after another show. Elvis's pink and white Cadillac catches fire and burns out about halfway to Texarkana in Fulton, Arkansas. 
Elvis's mother Gladys will always remember waking up from a deep sleep with the feeling that something was wrong. Others remembered Elvis sitting on the side of the road and being devastated watching his dreams go up in smoke. Elvis bought a new pink 1955 Cadillac Fleetwood 60 with a black top to replace the burnt one a month later. A removable wooden roof rack was used for the band's instruments. Thanks to a neighbor, Elvis repainted the car in pink, which he developed for Elvis. He called it Elvis Rose. Presley gave that Cadillac to his mother, thus turning it into perhaps the most famous car in the world. Gladys always proudly referred to it as her car. Elvis was very fond of that car. One November, Johnny Cash joined Presley's show and was amazed to see that Elvis took the time to hand wash his car thoroughly after driving it in the rain and through the mud on the way to Texarkana. By the way, would you like to know more about the difficult life of Johnny Cash? We always consider the wishes in the comments. Write whose biography you would like to know. Sun had already made 10 releases of Elvis Presley, Scotty, and Bill by August. A drummer joined the trio on the last recordings. Some songs, like That's Alright, were written in a language that one Memphis journalist called R&B idiom of Negro field jazz, and other songs like Blue Moon of Kentucky were more in the country field, but there was a curious blending of the two different musics in both. That mix of styles prevented Presley's music from receiving radio airplay. According to Bob Neal, many country music disc jockeys wouldn't play his music because he looked so much like a black artist. None of the R&B stations would pick him up because he sounded too much like a hillbilly. It was called rockabilly when that mix gained popularity. Elvis was already being called the King of Western Bop, the Hillbilly Cat, and the Memphis Flash at that time. The audience had never heard such music before, and they had never seen anyone before who played like Elvis Presley. Elvis almost always overshadowed all the headliners, even in the first days. Wherever he went, Elvis caused a big stir. Girls were screaming, fainting, and chasing him all over the South. Presley renewed Neal's management contract in August of that year, appointing Colonel Parker as his special advisor. The band maintained an extensive touring schedule during the second half of the year. Neal recalled, It was almost frightening the reaction that came to Elvis from the teenage boys. So many of them, through some sort of jealousy, would practically hate him. There were occasions in some towns in Texas when we'd have to be sure to have a police guard because somebody'd always try to take a crack at him. Almost every major and independent record company was asking about him by the summer of 1955. Elvis Presley was named the most promising male artist of the year at the Country Disc Jockey Convention in early November. Several record companies were interested in signing a contract with him. Elvis told them about his imminent transition to RCA, although the colonel had yet to complete the deal. Three major labels made offers worth about $25,000. Parker and Phillips made a deal with RCA Victor to purchase Presley's contract from Sun, including all material, for an unprecedented $40,000. The musician, at the age of 20, could not yet sign the contract himself, so his father did it for him. Parker arranged with the owners of Hill and Range Publishing. Gene and Julian Aberbach, to create two organizations, Elvis Presley Music and Gladys Music, to process the material Presley had recorded. The songwriters had to give up one-third of their regular fees in exchange for Elvis performing their compositions. RCA Victor began to heavily promote Presley by December and re-released many of his older recordings before the end of the month. Elvis held his first recording session for RCA at their Nashville studio two days after his 21st birthday on January 10th of next year. RCA Victor brought in guitarist Chet Atkins and three backing vocalists, including Gordon Stoker of the popular Jordanaires Quartet, to expand the sound, in addition to Presley's usual support of Moore, Black, Fontana, and Hayride pianist Floyd Kramer in concert. Among the songs recorded during that session was the unusual and slightly dreary Heartbreak Hotel. The single sold over 300,000 copies in its first three weeks of release. Soon, it would hit number one on the Billboard Pop Singles chart for eight weeks, as well as number one on the country chart and number five on the R&B chart. It became Elvis's first single to sell over a million copies, earning Elvis his very first gold award. In the meantime, Parker brought Presley to national television by inviting him to the CBS stage show in New York, which included six appearances in two months. 
After the first show, Presley stayed in town to record at RCA Victor Studios. Those New York sessions recorded Blue Suede Shoes and seven other songs, I Forgot to Remember to Forget, originally released back in August last year, reached the top of the Billboard National Country Singles Chart in February. Blue Suede Shoes was a single hit, but those new recordings were decisive in Elvis' career because they marked the moment he began to move away from his raw, clean sun sound towards the more commercial and spacious RCA sound. Neil's contract was terminated and Parker became Presley's manager in early March. RCA Victor released Presley's self-titled debut album on March 23rd. Together with five unreleased Sun recordings, the seven recently recorded tracks were the most diverse. Among them were two country songs and a bouncy pop tune, while the rest reflected the evolving sound of rock and roll. Elvis Presley became the first rock and roll album to top the Billboard charts and held that position for 10 weeks. And the cover is considered iconic and extols the importance of the guitar in the genre. One early day in March, before flying to Shreveport with cousin Gene Smith, Elvis writes a check to buy a $40,000 house for himself and his parents at 1034 Audubon Drive, an affluent suburban area east of downtown Memphis. Elvis bought the house with royalties from the Heartbreak Hotel. His parents moved into a new house while he was on tour. However, that was not the last move for the family. That same year, Elvis traveled to Los Angeles to audition for Paramount Studios, Elvis hummed blue suede shoes and performed a scene from the yet-to-be-made film The Rainmaker, which he didn't fit into. But serious acting ambitions did not leave the guy. Elvis was generally very fond of cinema. In the future, it would not be uncommon for him to rent entire cinemas in order to enjoy films in a relaxed atmosphere. Sometimes those cinema shows dragged on for the whole night. Elvis Presley signed a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures during his time in Las Vegas. Elvis's life was spinning and gaining momentum, becoming more and more turbulent. In an interview of that time, the artist told how many hours he usually slept. How much sleep do you get? On well, average, about four or five hours a night, I guess. Is that enough? No, it is really not, but I'm used to it, and I can't sleep any longer. Presley and his group fly to Nashville in April, got all three of them in a state of shock. At first, the pilot lost way and must land in El Dorado, Arkansas to refuel. Then, one of the engines cut out due to an incomplete tank of fuel. It almost fell over Arkansas. Upon arrival in Nashville, Elvis said, Man, I don't know if I'll ever fly again. The concerts continued and gathered crowded halls of 10,000 listeners, which did not always end well. An urgent message on the letterhead of the local Catholic diocesan newspaper was sent to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover after a speech in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It reported that Presley is a definite danger to the security of the United States. His actions and motions were such as to arouse the passions of teenaged youth. After the show, more than 1,000 teenagers tried to gang into Presley's room at the auditorium. After that incident in the summer of High Gardner's live TV interview show, Presley said, I don't feel like I'm doing anything wrong. I don't see how any type of music would have any bad influence on people. How would rock and roll music make anyone rebel against their parents? Later in September, the San Diego police chief said that if Elvis ever returned to his city and performed the way he did, he would be jailed for disorderly conduct. Ken Kenimer in the Lubbock Avalanche Journal wrote, In his dressing room between shows, Presley still couldn't get away from his following. The fans, oblivious to the dressing and undressing members of the band, leaked through police at the doorway to get pictures, autographs, or just a look. He signed autographs on pictures, notebooks, papers, legs, arms, and foreheads. Since mid-May, Colonel Parker had turned Elvis' concerts into his solo performances without the participation of other performers who could be considered competitors. That format ensured that Elvis would stand out as a mainstream artist and not just another rock and roller. Then Elvis first appeared at the Fox Theater in Detroit. In the summer, during the musicians' rest from tours, there were rumors about Elvis' engagement with June Juanico whom he met just a year ago at Biloxi. Fans suspected that they were having a relationship, but the rumors were not confirmed. 
By the way, at that time, Elvis had a unique, custom-made three-wheeled Messerschmitt. However, in mid-August 1957, Elvis exchanged the car for two and a half hours of shopping at the Lansky Brothers clothing store on Beale Street in Memphis. Presley started filming his first film, Love Me Tender, rented by 20th Century Fox from Paramount in August. It was originally called the Reno Brothers, but was renamed before release to capitalize on the Elvis single, which was sure to be a hit thanks to the soundtrack. Love me tender The film premiered on November 16th at the Paramount Theater in New York, followed by nationwide cinema shows. The film was set in the American South during the Civil War era of the 1800s. The film became a hit, and critics praised Presley's performance in that melodrama. Presley was accused of violating the morals of minors in the same August. Judge Marion Gooding prepared an arrest warrant for Presley if he twisted his hips at a concert in Jacksonville. After the concert, Elvis admitted to reporters, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong. However, he modified his show by replacing some of his less restrained body movements with meaningful pinky wiggles, but the audience was still going crazy. I can't really understand it. This is the only thing I can say. This is the only explanation I've got for it. I've been doing the same thing ever since I started singing on stage for at least two and a half years now. It's only been the past few months that I've felt criticism. I guess it's because my records have become bigger and everything. I guess the more popular you are, the more criticism you get. Elvis's first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show was a great success. More than 60 million people of all ages watched the show, and many think that it bridged the generational gap that allowed Elvis to become mainstream. Elvis Presley Day was proclaimed in Tupelo during that period of time. When he returned to the city of his birth as a big star, he performed two shows at the Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show, the same fair he performed at the age of 10. But now, a hundred National Guardsmen and police surrounded the stage to control the crowds of excited fans. 1956 was an extraordinary year for Elvis Presley. It was a regional sensation in January, but by the end of the year, he had become a national and international phenomenon. He recorded his first two albums for RCA and both sold millions of copies, made 11 national television appearances, signed a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures, and starred in his first film, Love Me Tender, and received four gold awards. The front page of the Wall Street Journal said that Elvis's merchandise had grown to $22 million in sales in the last few months. Elvis's appearances on national television were a turning point for America. His unconventional appearance and performance style sparked national controversy. Elvis Presley outraged adults, hypnotized teenagers of a new generation of youth, and soon became the leader of the cultural revolution that swept the country and had an impact on the whole world. The modest three-bedroom ranch-style house on Audubon Drive in East Memphis no longer suited the family of a star of that caliber, with thousands of onlookers and fans hanging around the house every day, waiting for Elvis. The Presley family moved again in March 1957. Elvis bought Graceland for $102,500, and that was the place where the musician was living for the next 20 years. Graceland was originally a 500-acre farm built during the American Civil War, only at the end of the 30s of the 20th century, a mansion was built instead, which today is associated with Elvis, no less than Elvis with him. When Elvis Presley was a child, he promised his parents that he would make a lot of money and buy them the best house in town, ending years of struggle. The charming and stately colonial revival mansion was the fulfillment of that childhood promise for the Presley family. After the death of Elvis, Graceland was valued at $350,000 and opened to tourists by Priscilla Presley in the summer of 1982. By the way, recognizable musical gates did not exist before Presley bought the house. They were designed by Abe Saucer, specifically for Elvis, and custom-built by John Dillers Jr. of Memphis Doors Incorporated. Elvis's second album came soon and included Old Shep. When I was a lad, an old show. First performed at a talent show back in 1945, tours continued. 
Concerts ended in violent and sometimes uncontrollable crowds of listeners on stage, with the Detroit newspaper suggesting that the problem with attending Elvis concerts was that you could get killed. Frank Sinatra was even more critical, describing rock and roll as brutal, ugly, degenerate, vicious. It fosters almost totally negative and destructive reactions in young people. It smells phony and false. It is sung, played, and written for the most part by cretinous goons. This rancid-smelling aphrodisiac I deplore. When Elvis was asked what he thought about it, he said, I admire the man. He has a right to say what he wants to say. He's a great success and a fine actor, but I think he shouldn't have said that. This is a trend, just the same as he faced when he started years ago. Soon, the artist's third Christmas album was released. Suddenly, on December 20th, Presley received a draft notice. He was granted a reprieve due to filming a new movie. The project was called King Creole, and at that time, Paramount and producer Hal Wallace had already invested $350,000 in production. Presley was drafted into the U.S. Army as a private of Fort Chaffee near Fort Smith, Arkansas on March 24, 1958. His arrival became a big news break for the media. Hundreds of people pounced on Presley as he got off the bus, and photographers escorted him to the fort. Elvis announced that he was looking forward to serving in the army and that he did not want to be treated differently than anyone else. The army can do anything it wants with me. Elvis's mother was diagnosed with hepatitis in early August, and her condition deteriorated rapidly. Presley was granted emergency leave to visit her, and she arrived in Memphis on August 12th. Two days later, she died of heart failure at the age of 46. Elvis was devastated and was never the same again. Their relationship remained extremely close throughout the years. Gladys and Elvis, even in adulthood, communicated with each other very gently, calling affectionate names. That's it. She just stayed the same all the way through the whole thing. I wish, you know, there's a lot of things happened uh, since she passed away that I wish she could have been around to see. It made her very happy and very proud. But uh, that's life. I can't, can't help after military training, Presley joined the 3rd Armored Division at Freitburg, Germany on the 1st of October. There, the sergeant introduced Presley to amphetamines, and he became deeply convinced of their benefits, not only for energy, but also for strength and weight loss. Many of his friends in the army joined Presley to indulge. In addition, in the army, Elvis got to know about karate, which he studied in earnest while training with Jürgen Seidel. It became his lifelong interest. He later used it in his live performances. Fellow soldiers saw Presley's desire to remain an ordinary soldier, despite the fame. They also remembered his generosity. He donated his army salary to charity and bought televisions for the base and an additional set of uniforms for everyone. Presley met 14-year-old Priscilla Bilou in Freitburg. They got married after a long seven and a half years of courtship. In her autobiography, Priscilla said that Presley was worried that his 24 months in the army would ruin his career. In the secret services, he could give concerts and keep in touch with the public, but Parker convinced him that in order to win the people's respect, he must serve his country as an ordinary soldier. Moreover, the label stocked up on unreleased Elvis material and was reinvigorating public interest for two years by making successful releases periodically. Presley returned to the United States on March 2, 1960, and was honorably discharged with the rank of sergeant. The train that took him from New Jersey to Tennessee was surrounded by a crowd of fans all the way, and Elvis got off at scheduled stops to please his fans. After that, he gave a short interview in which he spoke about the service and his future career. Do you have any advice for the boys your age who are now going to have to put in a certain amount of duty with, uh, in the service? Well, the only thing I can say is to, uh, to play it straight and, and, and to do your best because you can't fight them. A year later, RCA Victor gave Elvis a plaque stating that over 75 million of his records had been sold worldwide. Meanwhile, Parker pushed Presley into a busy filming schedule focused on banal music comedies on modest budgets. Presley initially insisted on key roles, but when two more dramatic films, Flaming Star (1960) and Wild in the Country (1961) proved less commercially successful, he returned to the old working formula. You live for me. There were a couple of exceptions among the 27 films Elvis starred in during the 1960s. The films were panned almost widely. Critic Andrew Kane called them a pantheon of bad taste. However, almost all of them were profitable. 
Fifteen of Elvis's films at that time were accompanied by soundtrack albums, and another five were soundtrack EPs. But due to the tight filming schedule, he often filmed three times a year. The quality of the soundtracks declined and became progressively worse. The Jordanaires Gordon Stoker recalled that Presley walked away from the microphone because, quote, the material was so bad that he felt like he couldn't sing it. The first stars were installed and opened on the Hollywood Walk of Fame on February 9, 1960. Eight performers were awarded that honor, including the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley proposed to Priscilla Ballou shortly before Christmas 1966. They married on May 1, 1967 in a short ceremony in their suite at the Aladdin Hotel in Las Vegas. The stream of formulaic films and assembly line soundtracks continued until the LP with the Clambake soundtrack hit record low sales in October 1967. The RCA management then recognized the problem, but by then the damage had already been done. Historians Connie Kirkberg and Mark Hendricks stated, Elvis was viewed as a joke by serious music lovers and a has-been to all but his most loyal fans. Elvis's first and only child, Lisa Marie, was born on February 1, 1968. The girl was born when the musician was deeply worried and dissatisfied with his career. Only two of the last eight singles hit the top 40. None of them took off above the 28th line of the top, not to mention the first places. Thanks to Colonel Parker, Presley reappeared on NBC for the first time in eight years since the Sinatra Timex show. A special episode called Elvis, which was released in December 1968, collected pleasant reviews and slightly rehabilitated Presley in the face of the audience. Right now, Encouraged by the comeback special appearance, he took part in a prolific recording session at American Sound Studio that resulted in the acclaimed From Elvis in Memphis album. It was the first non-soundtrack secular album to celebrate an eight-year period in the studio, which was released in June 1969. It was followed by more live performances. Cassandra Peterson, who worked as a dancer in Las Vegas, met Presley during that period and recalled their meeting. He was so anti-drug when I met him. I mentioned to him that I smoked and he was just appalled. He said, don't ever do that again. Moreover, Elvis was not only categorically against recreational drugs, but also rarely drank. Several members of his family were alcoholics, and he intended to avoid a similar fate. Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer filmed the rehearsal and concert at the International in August for the documentary Elvis, That's the Way It Is. Presley performed in the jumpsuit, which became a hallmark of his live performances. During that period, Elvis received death threats unless $50,000 was paid. He had often been the target of many threats, unbeknownst to him, since the 1950s. The FBI took the threats seriously and increased security for the next two shows. Presley took the stage with a Derringer in his right boot and a 45 caliber pistol in his belt. Fortunately, the concerts passed without incident. Presley met with President Richard Nixon at the White House on December 21, 1970. Elvis expressed his patriotism and how he thought he could apply to hippies to help fight against the drug culture that he and the president hated. Elvis asked Nixon for the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs badge to add to the collection of similar items he was starting to collect, and thus signified the official sanction of his patriotic efforts. The U.S. Junior Chamber of Commerce named Presley one of the 10 most outstanding young men of the nation on January 16, 1971. Shortly thereafter, the city of Memphis named the section of Highway 51 South, where Graceland is located, Elvis Presley Boulevard. In the same year, Presley became the first rock and roll singer to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award, Bing Crosby Award, from the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, the Grammy Award organization. In the same year, three new studio albums by Presley, which were not related to the cinema, were released. Best of all, critics appreciated Elvis Country. It was a concept album focused on the standards of the genre. When I was young, my heart was young then too. Anything. He was filmed again by Metro Goldwyn Mayer the following year, that time in Elvis on Tour, which won the Golden Globe Award for Best Documentary Film that same year. Meanwhile, Presley's relationship was getting worse and much more confusing. He and his wife became increasingly distant, estranged, and barely cohabiting. His relations with Joyce Bova, unexpectedly for Elvis, led to her pregnancy and abortion in 1971. He often spoke to her about the possibility of moving to Graceland, believing that he and Priscilla would probably get a divorce. The Presleys got divorced, 
On February 23, 1972, after Priscilla revealed her relationship with Mike Stone, a karate instructor whom Presley had recommended to her. Five months later, Presley's new girlfriend, Linda Thompson, a songwriter and former Memphis beauty queen, moved in with him. Presley's filed for divorce on August 18th. Then, at a rare press conference, a reporter asked Presley if he was happy with his image, to which Elvis replied, Well, the image is one thing and the human being is another. It's very hard to live up to an image. Presley played two charitable concerts for Cooley Cancer Fund in January 1973 due to the groundbreaking television special Aloha from Hawaii, which was the artist's first solo concert to be broadcast worldwide. Presley's stage costume has become the most elaborate and most recognizable with which his modern image is closely associated. At the end of the show, when Elvis spread his cloak with the image of an American eagle with spread wings on his back, he became a god figure. Finally, Presley's divorce process was finalized on October 9, 1973. The musician was very worried about Mike Stone and even thought of killing him. Elvis was almost attacked at the last concert and thought that it was Stone who sent killers to him. In fact, they were some rabid fans who, in a fit of love for their idol, climbed onto the stage. However, by that time, Elvis's health had seriously deteriorated. He overdosed on barbiturates two times in a year and spent three days in a coma after the first incident in his hotel room. He was hospitalized in a semi-comatose state in the end of 1973 due to pethidine addiction. The possible reason for his deteriorating health was that since his return, Elvis had given more live performances every year, and in 1973 there were 168. It was his busiest schedule. He ventured into another intense touring schedule in 1974, despite failing health. The two most popular and successful concert performers of the 1970s were Elvis Presley and Led Zeppelin, and coincidentally they caught up in May 1974 because they shared a common promoter. Although Elvis was not a big fan of hard rock, he knew who the Zeppelins were. At some point, he was probably alerted to the presence of a rock band in the hall because he turned to his musicians. Wait a minute, if we can start together, fellas, because we've got Led Zeppelin out there, let's try to look like we know what we're doing, whether we do or not. Unfortunately, in September, Elvis's condition worsened dramatically. Keyboardist Tony Brown recalled Presley's arrival at a concert at the University of Maryland. He fell out of the limousine to his knees. People jumped to help and he pushed them away, like, don't help me, guitarist John Wilkinson recalled. I watched him in his dressing room, just draped over a chair, unable to move. So often I thought, boss, why don't you just cancel this tour and take a year off? He patted me on the back and said, it'll be all right, don't you worry about it. RCA began to worry when Elvis lost interest in recording. Elvis has not been able to record a single since 1973. RCA shipped a mobile recorder to Graceland that made two full-scale recording sessions possible at Presley's home in 1976. The recording process became a struggle for him, even with that convenient approach. The released singles did not become significant hits, although the figure of Elvis Presley was still significant at the national level. Presley and Linda Thompson broke up in November of that year, and he soon met Ginger Alden. He proposed to the girl and gave her an engagement ring just two months later. Although some of his friends later claimed that he had no serious intentions of remarrying. During that period of time, Elvis canceled concerts because he could no longer sing normally and be on stage for a long time. Elvis's father, Vernon, became closely involved in his son's finances and fired his three bodyguards called the Memphis Mafia, citing budget cuts. In the same year, the book Elvis, What Happened? was published, co-authored with fired bodyguards. Elvis was devastated by the book and unsuccessfully tried to stop its publication by offering money to publishers. By that point, Presley was already suffering from glaucoma, hypertension, liver damage, and colon enlargement, an illness increased and exacerbated by drug abuse. Presley was going to fly out of Memphis to begin a new tour on a Tuesday evening, on August 16, 1977. He had a good rest with his friends the day before and went to his bedroom in Graceland. On the day of departure, Ginger Alden found him unconscious on the bathroom floor. Elvis was taken to the hospital, but upon arrival, he was already dead. Attempts to resuscitate were unsuccessful, and at 3.30 p.m., Elvis Presley was announced dead 
at Baptist Memorial Hospital at the age of 42. Thousands of fans gathered around Graceland on the day of the funeral. They kept coming and coming to the gate, wanting to see Elvis's open coffin. The funeral of Elvis Presley was held in Graceland on Thursday, August 18th. A car crashed into a group of fans outside the gate, killing two women and seriously injuring a third one. About 80,000 people lined the procession route to Forest Hill Cemetery, where the legendary singer was buried next to his mother. The cemetery was constantly visited by fans. However, after someone attempted to steal Elvis's body, Presley's and his mother's remains were exhumed and reburied at Graceland's Meditation Garden. Elvis Presley's father said in an interview, Elvis's death was so sudden that it will be years before I'll be able to accept the fact that it really happened. Yet even while grieving, I've been greatly comforted by the thousands of fans who loved Elvis and who have expressed their sympathy. They know they'll never see him perform again, but they'll cherish always the memory of the pleasure he gave them. As will I. Although, due to mismatches between medical indications and causes of death, there is still a conspiracy theory among fans that Elvis faked his death and there was a doll in the coffin at the funeral. President Jimmy Carter made a statement appreciating Elvis's impact on the nation's culture. His music and his personality, fusing the styles of white country and black rhythm and blues, permanently changed the face of American popular culture. His following was immense, and he was a symbol to people the world over of the vitality, rebelliousness, and good humor of his country. Six of Presley's posthumously released singles were top 10 country hits between 1977 and 1981. The famous Elvis Mansion was opened to the public in 1982. It has become the second most visited house, attracting over half a million visitors annually after the White House. It was declared a National Historic Landmark in 2006. Elvis has been inducted into five music halls of fame. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, the Rockabilly Hall of Fame, and the Memphis Music Hall of Fame. He was awarded the W.C. Handy Award from the Blues Foundation and honored with the first Golden Hat Award from the Academy of Country Music in 1984. He got the American Music Awards Award of Merit in 1987. Elvis has been in the top three top-earning deceased celebrities, according to Forbes magazine, for 15 years since 2000, with a record annual income of $60 million. Presley is the record holder for most songs in the Billboard Top 40, with 115 songs. Elvis kept several horses at Graceland. They are still important to the Graceland estate. Elaine Alexander, a local former teacher, has been taking care of horses in Graceland for 38 years. She and Priscilla Presley love horses, so a special friendship has developed between them. Elvis brought horses to Graceland specifically for Priscilla. A horse named Palomino Rising Sun was Elvis' favorite horse, and there are many photos of him riding it. Respect for the personality of Elvis does not subside to this day. President Donald Trump posthumously awarded Presley the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2018. And after some time, information about the forthcoming biopic about Elvis Presley appeared. And now, on May 25, 2022, the first premiere of Elvis took place at the Cannes Film Festival. The theatrical release is scheduled by Warner Brothers on June 24th. The film will tell about the life and career of Elvis Presley from childhood to becoming a singer, rock and roll star, and film actor, as well as his complicated relationship with his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, who will be played by Tom Hanks. The role of Elvis went to Austin Butler, and the young Presley will be performed by Shiden J. The film tells about the life and career of Elvis Presley, starting from his childhood and before he became a singer, rock and roll star and movie actor, as well about his difficult relationship with his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, whose role was played by Tom Hanks. Austin Butler got the role of Elvis. The film became the second highest grossing musical biopic of all time after Bohemian Rhapsody, which once again confirms that the fans' love for Elvis Presley does not die even after many years. He was nominated for eight awards at the 95th Academy Awards, including for acting Austin Butler. Elvis Presley lived a short life, but an eventful life full of tours, moves, TV shows, unique encounters, big screen roles, and music. He became one of those who brought joy and inspiration to millions of people. 
And you can find out about others, equally iconic personalities, by clicking on the icon that appears on your screen. There are many more biographies of the favorites of millions on our channel, and every viewer will find something interesting here. You should follow the link and see for yourself. Thank you for watching this video till the end. It will be great if you like it. It was Inco Stories, and we do not say goodbye, we say see you again.